gospel? Here it comes. No. Last week we talked about being ready with the gospel. Today we want to talk about being ready for the gospel. That song, Pass It On, one that uh, was written back in the 70s, uh, sung by many of us in our youth groups and in our youth ministry, and maybe in our churches uh, for, for a while. Uh, it it kind of underscored a, a movement of youth evangelism and discipleship back then. We want to pass it on, this message of God's love. And there, there's nothing like it. When the world was preaching free love, God was preaching love too. Love that's only found in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Being ready with the gospel is something that we talked about last Sunday. And just to refresh our memories, uh, we talked about a few things about it. Let me go back. There we go. We talked about what it is to be a witness. It's someone who has eyewitness experience of something that has happened to them, i.e., we have direct one-on-one -on -one eyewitness experience coming to know the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. But it also means to be a spectator, to be watching what's going on in the world around us and being a witness of God's love in the situations where we're placed. We talked about what kinds of witnesses there are. The strong, silent witness who leads by example, who witnesses by example. Uh, we have the hinter, you know, you know, hinter, just dropping little hints here and there. You know, someone would say, oh, what a glorious sunrise. Someone would say, what's a sunrise? Uh, but then uh, we would say, oh, what a glorious sunset. Where'd that come from? Well, God, who put creation into motion, he is the one who created it and made it so that we can enjoy uh, such um, such natural phenomena. Uh, the inviter to the big fishermen. Hey, you know what? We, we got a speaker coming to our church. We, or we got, uh, there, I'd like to take you with me to a, to a concert. And fully knowing that the gospel is going to be presented. We're an inviter to the big fishermen. You know, the big fishermen who um, will cast out the gospel hook and then reel them in for you, right? Yeah. Then there's the speaker the one who is unashamed and will speak about Jesus Christ on every opportunity at every chance that he or she gets. And it doesn't matter how many people are there. Uh, if anybody will listen, even if nobody listens, this one will, will be one who would speak the gospel. And then there's the one-on-one -on -one witness, someone uh, who excels in the face-to-face -face sharing, to get to know someone to earn their trust, to gain their trust, and to be able to share one-on-one -on -one what Jesus has done for us and that they can know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior also. Those are the kinds of witnesses uh, we talked about last week. Then we talked about the non-negotiables of the gospel. Man's need. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and only Jesus Christ, who is 100% God and 100% man, he is the one who makes salvation available to us. And at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he's Lord. Well, we do that because of the work of Jesus Christ. He died on the cross that our sins might be forgiven, that our, uh, that our debt of uh, our, our debt would be paid for by his atonement and by the redemption that we have in him. And the nature of saving faith. It's not by works that we're saved. No, it's by, it's by faith. It's by grace through faith. Faith is believing in the things that we can't see or touch or feel or, or taste. It's what we believe in our heart. And man needs to respond. Man needs to respond to the gospel. God's not going to ask you if your moms uh, believed in the Lord Jesus Christ as a condition of being accepted into his heaven for eternity. God's going to ask you, what did you do? 
What did you do with the Lord Jesus Christ? What did you do when you were presented with the gospel? So there are some non-negotiables of the gospel that we talked about. And then we, uh, we've been looking at a few questions here the last uh, couple of weeks. What is the peril of keeping the gospel silent? And the peril of keeping the gospel silent is people are going to be um, not hearing the gospel, therefore they would have all the more opportunity to spend eternity separated from God in hell. That's the peril. So whose responsibility is it to communicate the gospel? And I'm very thankful that at least uh, in the sanctuary here I didn't see fingers being pointed back at me because, yes, I would agree with you, but I also heard that um, it's our responsibility. It's all of our responsibility. And what kind of witness are you then? Are, are you a hinter? Are you an inviter? Are you a speaker? Are you one-on-one? -on -one? What kind of a witness are you? Because we are all witnesses. If we know the Lord Jesus Christ is our Savior, we are all eyewitnesses of his grace. We are all eyewitnesses of God's power. And so what is the key to being a good witness for the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, it's to be prepared. It's to be prepared. Now, I know we might be feeling a little nervous here. <laughs> What's the preacher going to ask me to do? Nothing yet. Here we go. Um, how do we know who's ready? How do we know who's ready? I mean, if we have this burning desire to share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, well, we, we may be a little nervous about, well, I really want the person to be interested that, I, that I'm sharing with. So how do we know who's ready? Turn with me, if you're not there already, to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16, uh, the passage that, that Tim read for us. We see that the Holy Spirit is already involved. Look at verses 6, 7, and 8 with me. Paul and his companions traveled through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. Now, did you, did you follow along there? The Holy Spirit actually prevented Paul from preaching the word? Huh, that doesn't seem right, does it? But you know what? There are times when the Holy Spirit does not have someone actually ready with ears to hear. Sometimes God's agenda supersedes our agenda. You see, Paul's agenda was to, to go and get into the province of Asia, but... Paul was kept. He was prevented. He was slowed down by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. Yet yeah, there are times when we are to, yes, continue to be a witness. We stand for truth. We stand for what's right. Um, our, our morality must match uh, biblical morality. There are times when that strong, silent witness, yeah, is there. You see, Paul... Uh, wanted to preach the word. He wanted to be the speaker there in Asia. Excuse me, Asia. But we get to verse 7, and we see they came to the border of Mysia. They tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of the Lord, a Spirit of Jesus, rather, would not allow them to. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. Hmm. Paul kept on knocking on the door, and the door didn't open. But God knew better, didn't he? The Holy Spirit is already involved when it comes to being ready for the gospel. What do we learn from verses 9 through 12? You see, during the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. You see, God directs us to those 
to whom he has called us. Those are two big principles here. Number one, we need to go where God directs us. Many years ago, 1997 it was, I was sensing that I wasn't going to be in the current place of ministry where, where I was very much longer. I had no idea where God wanted me to go. But he showed me from his word that uh, it was back in a uh, passage in Judges uh, and in Exodus. There were, there were two sets of verses there that uh, said, you know what? I, I'm going ahead of you already. I'm preparing by my spirit the place where you are to go. And so I had to rest in that. I had to trust in that. And shortly thereafter, at the beginning of 1998, there are a few of you who are here now who were here then, and you remember that, that uh, I came in to fill the pulpit for a week or two. Um, it's been 22 and a half years later. So, um, yeah, you know, God directs us to those to whom he has called us to share the gospel. One of the things that I do uh, as a pastor to other pastors is uh, do some pastoral assessments as they work on developing a pastoral uh, development plan. And one of the things that we ask them is about their call to ministry. Are, are they in the ministry because God has called them to be his witness? Are they in the ministry in order to shepherd God's people? Are they in the ministry to make disciples? And do they see it as a vocational calling from God or... Is it a meal ticket? Is it a paycheck? Your hair, if it was not curly already, would get curly with some of the answers that I've gotten to that, to that very question. Yeah. God directs us to those to whom he has called us to share the gospel. Notice the obedience factor here with Paul. Now we see the recording of this vision that Paul had. A man of Macedonia. That was a whole different geographic area. Standing and begging Paul, come to Macedonia and help us. What did Paul do? He concluded that God had called them to preach the gospel in Macedonia. So at once, immediately, they got ready and they went. Verses 11 and 12, we see from Troas, we put out the sea, still straight for Samothrace. And the next day to Neapolis, from there we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony, and the leading city of that district of Macedonia. And we stayed there several days. That was quite the itinerary that Paul had to go through in order to get from where he was on the border of Mysia and Bithynia to get over to ultimately the city of Philippi. And we know that God uh, moved greatly in the city of Philippi. And we know the relationship there because Paul wrote a whole letter to the Philippian people. God directs us to those whom he has called us to share the gospel, and he does that by his spirit. What's next? Prayer is, and I'm using the word customary here. Read verse 13 with me. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, now follow this. Remember, in Macedonia, they needed help. And the only help that was really going to work would be the help that the Lord Jesus Christ would have to give to them. They needed help. Even in uh, Philippi, in, in the synagogue, uh, they usually needed men to lead the synagogue. There weren't even men, because we'll find out in a minute why there were women gathered outside the city gate along the river where there were women gathered for prayer. Paul knew already that there were people there who worshiped God. He knew that the Spirit had prepared the way for him to go there. And so having spent several days there, I'm, I'm sure Paul did a quick assessment of the city 
and he got to know what was and what is in Philippi. And so they went outside the gate, and they found this place of prayer. Prayer was expected. Now, you look at maybe in your translation, you have a word that's more like customary. Every Sabbath day, these women gathered as it was their custom to pray and to worship God. I can't underscore enough the role of prayer in engaging our culture. We need to be praying. We cannot know who is ready for the gospel. In fact, we can't even be ready with the gospel unless prayer is customary. If our prayer is, Lord, help me get through the day, okay, yeah, he'll, he'll help us get through the day. But if, if our prayer customarily is, Lord, help me through the day, and would you help me to be aware of that person that you're directing me to to share the gospel with today? Would you help me be a witness? Help me to be aware. Prayer is customary. And it's not just during that hour a week at the appointed hour on, on the day of the Sabbath. No, prayer is customary. It is happening. And it happens regularly. It happens consistently. And it happens expectantly. Now, we get into a, kind of a, a fun part of the story here. How do we know that people are ready for the gospel? It's because God, it's because God opens hearts to respond. Look at the story of Lydia here, starting in verse 14. One of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Theatira, who was a worshiper of God. Okay, so Lydia was a godly woman. She was acting on what she knew about God. And she knew that she was one to worship with all of her heart, to fear God and give him the honor and glory that's due his name. In fact, as we were talking about this in the previous hour, um, we thought that maybe she was the leader of that prayer meeting. She was the organizer in chief. Could be. We don't know that for sure, but it could be. But she was listening to what? She was listening to what Paul was saying. Paul and his companions, they began to speak to the women who had gathered there. Lydia was listening. She was a worshiper of the of God, and verse 14 at the end says, the Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. Paul's message was grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's message was the gospel. God opened her heart. We think that we have to do the work in being a witness. We think that we have to do the work in, in snagging people with the gospel bait and making them believe. We can't make people believe anything. God opens hearts to respond. It's not the skill of the witness. It's not the power of the evangelist. Rather, it's the love of God and the prompting of the Holy Spirit that opens people's hearts to respond. And respond she did. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. So it wasn't even just Lydia. It was her whole household. Kids. We don't know anything about a husband, but since she was a businesswoman, she might have had people that worked for her that were a part of her household. They might have been servants. But whoever found their lodging under her roof, she passed it on. She passed it on. And she invited them to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Wow. Wow. You have, you have opened up a door to me to know God personally. I've been worshiping him, and, and yet I know now who my Redeemer is. My Redeemer is the Lord Jesus Christ. I accept him. I'm baptized in his name. Come and stay at my house. I want to learn all I can. Wow. Wow. 
So how do we know who's ready? Hey, whoever the Holy Spirit is already involved in, he directs us to them. He calls us to them. We're praying about it, and so are they, perhaps. But God opens hearts to respond. That should take all of the pressure off of our shoulders. Because you know what? If someone doesn't respond, it means the Holy Spirit hasn't gotten them to the point of being ready. But we've planted a seed, or we've watered a seed, or we've broken up some hard ground, whatever it is. We've had a part in opening people's hearts, or maybe at least their ears or their minds to the gospel. But God opens hearts. God opens hearts. So, how then do we share with those who are ready? Well, no, 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 I'm feeling a little squirmy again. But, but how do we share with those who are ready? Well, most importantly, they will know we are Christians by our love. Did you know that? There's a song by that title. I thought I'd sing it today, but we're not going to sing it today. Um, but yeah, they will know we are Christians by our love. That should be the first thing. A lot of us think we need to stand up for the truth. We need to be right because we're right and we know we're right. And the, the more we preach, you see, see the, the very weak gesture here? This is called a weak gesture, the axe chop. <laughs> Tie fix is a very nervous gesture. But anyway, uh, I do remember something I learned in seminary. How about that? Uh, anyway, they will know we are Christians by our love. If people know that they are loved, if people know that we are concerned not just to, uh, about being heard by them, if people know that we are concerned about hearing them, if we take time to develop a relationship, and that time might be very short, it might take weeks, it might take months, but when people see the love of the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives, then that is the most important thing. When I was in college, I was a part of a parachurch ministry, uh, parachurch, uh, parachurch, yeah, I guess it was a parachurch ministry, where we went to a state institution for, uh, for children that were delayed in some way, and there were also adults that would age out of the child part of it, and they would move into another hall for the adult part. Well, I got to work with the adults because I wasn't an education major, uh, but I had this heart for the disabled. And uh, basically, we did Sunday school programming for uh, these, uh, these folks who were resident of the, uh, the Polk State Mental Hospital in Polk, Pennsylvania. And uh, uh, after, about a, oh, after about a semester and a, or so, uh, they must have thought I was doing okay because they would send all the newbies with me since I had the highest functioning group. Then we didn't want to scare people away too quickly. But this was actually Valentine's Day. And so I took the opportunity to share the gospel about asking Jesus into your heart. You know, the whole idea about the heart and, and coming to know Jesus and believing in him with all of your heart, with all your soul, and, and all that. And I had a newbie there with me. Her name was Donna. And uh, she didn't say a thing during the whole time. But yet we, we got through that hour and a half of programming, got back on the bus, and went back to Grove City. I didn't see her again till the next till the next week, where she showed up again. We always thought it was great when the newbies showed up a second time. Then we thought, ah, oh, yeah, all right, here we go. We got another one. And so I followed up because two or three of the residents had had accepted Christ as, as their savior that night. And we rejoiced about that on the bus ride home. And so we followed up on that. And uh, the, this young lady was she was quite engaged with. The, the way the class went. So I went to find her after. I mean, this was only a 44-passenger coach bus that was maybe half full. There were 20-some of us that went there. I went to find her afterwards. I wanted to see what she thought. She was in the back of the bus crying. She was so convicted about what she had seen and what she had heard, so convicted about the difference from what she was hearing as she grew up in, in her church that wasn't preaching the gospel. 
long story short, about an hour later, we were sitting in the chapel back on campus, and I was able to lead her to Christ. And she basically took my class after that time. I was led to go on in, in other areas of, of ministry. And she took that class, and she last time I knew she was, she was a teacher in a Christian school. How about that? The key thing here, remember I said I didn't see her once in that intervening week? She told me as she was sobbing in the back of that bus that she saw me so many times during that week. She wanted to come up to me and talk to me because she had this burning desire in her heart to know Jesus personally. And every time I was so busy, I was surrounded by people and I was having fun. I, now, you know how much of a social butterfly I am. <laughs> Not as much. But she saw that uh, there was some joy in my life and she wanted that too. They will know we are Christians by our love and by how we conduct ourselves. That's the most important thing. Now, if we're going to share with those who are ready, we need to explain the gospel in an organized way, too. I had a lesson plan when I presented the gospel to those residents. We have non-negotiables for the gospel. We have to include who Jesus is, what he's done for us, and that we have a need that only he can fulfill, and we need to respond to that. Explain the gospel in an organized way. We'll get a couple helps for that in just a moment. We need to define and clarify biblical terms like grace. We ask people what grace is, and they'll say it's what we say before meals, right? No. <laughs> um, yes, we can call it grace, but what is grace? What is propitiation? What is mercy? What is the law? What is sin? We have to explain these biblical terms that are not part of our common cultural vocabulary. We need to illustrate. You know, Jesus used parables. Jesus used parables. So we can use examples too, especially our testimonies. That's why I have some of our leadership share their testimonies. Over the, we haven't done it for a few months, but we're going to get back into that soon. Um, we can use examples too, and we'll get into a couple helps for that in just a minute. We also need to encourage by our attitude. Are we convinced that the gospel is true? Are we convinced of that? So, how do we share then? How do we share? Well, there are some helpful tools. More recently, you know what I've found to be the most effective tool? Someone's own Bible. If you're visiting someone in their home and you notice that there's a Bible sitting on the table or on a shelf, ask them to get their own Bible. You can show them from their own Bible that what you're saying is not anything that's off the wall. This is in their own Bible. Use their own Bible if it's available. Otherwise, use yours. Now, there are, there are some things that you can do. There are some tools out there. Campus Crusade for Christ put together something called the Four Spiritual Laws many years ago. It's, it's an okay tool. Uh, it covers the basics. Number one, God loves you. Number two, we are sinful and we're separated from God. Just like there are laws that govern nature in the universe, there are laws that govern our spiritual lives as well. God loves you. We're sinful, separated from God. And it's only through Jesus Christ that you can know and experience God's love and salvation. And then fourthly, we must receive Jesus Christ as our Savior and our Lord. These are four spiritual laws, and, and you can take time and develop each of these four spiritual laws. But it's available in a, in a booklet and it's a way that we can share the gospel with people. What about this? The wordless book. You ever seen the word, wordless book? We, we've seen the wordless book, right? Uh, this is a simplified version of the world, wordless book. It was first developed by Child Evangelism Fellowship back in the, I want to say, the 40s or the 50s. And it was used to help explain the gospel to children. Now, you can't read the, the letters in here. But we see gold, well, hey, we, we all want to go to heaven someday, right? Heaven's a place where God lives and the streets are paved with gold. But there's a problem. 
it's this black session. We are, for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God, our, our hearts aren't, aren't pure. Our, there's something wrong with, with our, in our hearts. So what happened? Jesus shed his blood. He died on the cross that we might be forgiven from our sins. And then, you see, we become pure. Our hearts are washed whiter than snow. And then we can grow green. We can grow in the Lord as we read our Bible and pray every day. The wordless book. That's another way that we can explain the gospel in an organized fashion. Well, what else is there? The bridge to life. I particularly like this one um, because it's, it's easy to do. I have drawn it on a napkin in a restaurant. I've put it on a whiteboard. I've, I've, I've used it all kinds of ways. But basically, it, it shows that, you know what? Man has a problem. Now, as you draw this out, you draw this side. Man's on this side. Man has a problem. That's sin. And sin has a penalty, and that's death. On the other side, you know, God has a purpose for us. Whoops. God has a purpose for us. He wants us to know him. He wants us to have eternal life in heaven with him. The alternative is eternal death. And, you know, this cross doesn't get drawn in until the very end of our discussion of sharing the gospel, you know. So here we are. Here, here I am on January 16, 1973. I was peeking over. I knew that there was eternal life on the other side, but I knew that I was in, I was in seventh grade. Seventh grade boys, except for Caleb. Yeah. yeah. Um, seventh grade boys, uh, you know, they, this one started walking down the wrong road. And I had a Sunday school teacher who I knew loved Jesus, and uh, someone came and shared their testimony that day, and man, I was, I, was, I was on the edge of that cliff. I was looking. I knew that there was eternal life over there, and I knew I didn't have it. But I struggled with accepting that Jesus paid it all, because you know what? I was a good boy. I never had got called down to the principal's office well one time, but the whole the whole third grade class got called down and had to sit in outside Miss Moore's office. She was scary. Uh, <laughs> but when we draw in the cross, when we find that the only way from this side to that side is the bridge made out of the cross, see then when we move on the basis of Christ's payment, the penalty for our sin, then we know that we can be saved. All kinds of ways to share the gospel with those who are ready for the gospel. We are to be ready with the gospel for those who are ready for the gospel. And you know what? The more we depend on the Holy Spirit, the easier it will be. I trust that you are ready with the gospel for those who are ready for the gospel. Because you know what? There are people who are looking over the edge, especially now. What if I die from this COVID thing? There are people that are scared of it because they don't know where they will end up. They don't know when they close their eyes if they'll open them up in the presence of God Almighty. They hope they do, but they need to know that they do. What an opportunity we have to love people into the kingdom of heaven. Are you ready with the gospel for those who are ready for the gospel? We'll pick up on how we can love people into the kingdom of heaven next time we get together. But for now, let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you have a purpose for us, and that purpose is for us to enjoy life eternal with you in your heaven. Thank you, Father, that there's only one way to peace with you, and that's through the bridge that brings life, the bridge of the cross where Jesus paid it all because we had a debt that we owed that we could not pay. Father, thank you. Thank you for paying that debt. Thank you, Lord, for your spirit in our lives that enables us 
to know you and to know your will and to know those who are ready. So, Father, would you use us? Would you direct us to those who need to know Jesus as their Savior? And, Lord, help us to be obedient and to go immediately when you call us. Help us, Lord, to uh, speak as your Spirit directs us and to use whatever tools that you would enable us to have. Lord, thank you for saving us. Help us to pass it on to those who are lost and scared and need to know you too. We ask your blessing now as we go. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.